Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment um, as we get settled. Um, and and we're very happy to have you here. Valerie, I just want to make sure it's Kelly Winner who is the. Oh, wait, have we not gotten live? I thought we were going live. It should be Kelly Winner. That is correct. Okay. I'm uh, trying to promote her to panelist and having Thank you. a little bit of a challenge, but okay. She, here she comes. Okay. Um, so, hello, my name is Dr. Kyle Livy. I am a professor of history and co-director of the Lytton Center for History and the Public Good here at Ohlone College. And it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to our talk from Dr. Aurora Cheng. Um, uh, I'm gonna do some brief housekeeping before I hand things over to Dr. Catherine Michael, who will introduce Dr. Cheng. But before that, I wanna read the Lytton Center mission statement. So, so you can learn a little bit if you're new um, to the Lytton Center, just so you can learn a little bit more about who we are and what we do. The Lytton Center considers the ways that the study of the past can, can shape, help shape the present and the future. Our mission is to inspire the Ohlone community to work for the public good through programming focused on access, equity, inclusion, justice, and service. The Lytton Center explores challenges facing our community and the world, past, present, and future, and fosters big ideas that will inspire and transform Ohlone and the larger community for the better. Through training, programming, and capacity building, the Lytton Center empowers students to advocate for a just and equitable world. So I'm gonna hand things over to my co-director, um, Dr. Catherine Michael, but we encourage you as you're um, enjoying this talk and engaging with this talk to think about and ask questions and be ready to engage um, in a conversation when the talk is completed. To do this, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll give you some reminders in the chat as we go. Um, you can pose any questions that you have, and we will bring those questions um, to Dr. Cheng. Um, during the Q&A once the talk is completed. Now I'm gonna hand things over um, to Dr. Michael. Hi everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. So I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. So Dr. Aurora Chang is a once undocumented Guatemalan immigrant turned hyper-documented professor of higher education at Loyola University, Chicago. A graduate of UC Berkeley, Stanford University and the University of Texas at Austin. She earned her doctoral degree in curriculum and instruction with a programmatic focus on cultural studies in education. As a 25 year educator, she began her career as an English, English as a second language high school teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area, the foundation of her career. Prior to her role as an assistant professor at Loyola University, she spent 15 years in diverse leadership roles that spanned the pre-K to 20 spectrum, as well as public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including stints at the College Board, the University of California at Berkeley, the University of Texas at Austin, Beloit College, and the University of Wyoming. Dr. Chang's research centers on the intersection of education, identity, and agency within traditionally marginalized communities. Currently, she focuses on four research areas. First, Latinx educational experiences with a focus on those that are undocumented. Second, multiracially identified students' educational experiences. Third, how educators of all backgrounds can effectively reflect on their ped pedagogical practices in an effort to serve students of marginalized backgrounds. And fourth, the experiences of faculty women of color in the academy. So with that, we are so happy to welcome Dr. Ara Cheng. I am actually going to put in the chat a link to one of her articles. Um, and so now I will hand it over to our speaker. Thank you so much, Catherine and Kyle, uh, for inviting me. 
excuse me, <clears throat> uh, for having me today. It's really wonderful um, to be here. Um, so if you'll uh, give me a moment, I'm going to uh, share my screen. or I'm going to try and share my screen. Interesting. Okay. Give me a sec while I reload this. This should work. Yeah. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. And I, I just wanna start by dedicating a few moments of silence to all refugees, all undocumented people across the globe. Thank you. So again, my name is Dr. Aurora Chang, and today I'm going to talk um, actually about my book, The Struggles of Identity, Education, and Agency in the Lives of Undocumented Students, The Burden of Hyperdocumentation. Um, and we are at different points. I'm actually going to ask you to follow along if you'd like. And that's why we've included one of the articles that is in the book. Um, because I'm going to read from it um, from now and then. So uh, let me just talk a little bit about um, who I am and how I got here, because it, it's, been, it's been a journey. <clears throat> you know, um, so at the top of this slide, it says the personal is academic. And one of my missions uh, in my life is to encourage people to share their stories, share their communities stories, their family stories, and transform those stories into um, academies, um, into academic language, academic articles, academic talks. Uh, because so many of us uh, that come from marginalized backgrounds and that have been minoritized and, and racialized and otherwise, have not been given, at times even been forbidden, uh, to uh, share these stories and consider them as official knowledge. So my story starts uh, in Guatemala, where I was born, um, in uh, Guatemala City. Um, and my background, um, the topic of my next book that's coming out later this summer, um, as a racial queer, as I call it, a, a multiracial person um, that queers the uh, sort of normative constructions of race. Um, I bring that up because my, my family, um, although most of us were born in Guatemala, uh, my background is one that is very uh, racially uh, entangled and part of the diaspora. My uh, Italian grandfather on my mom's side my Chinese grandfather on my mom's side, I'm sorry, on my dad's side, and then um, also my uh, Mayan indigenous uh, great grandmother um, on my mom's side. All of those um, make up uh, who I am. Um, and when I was five years old, um, some of us in my family immigrated um, to California. So we lived first in West Covina in Southern California for about uh, a year. And then we moved to Richmond, California, where I did all my schooling, public schooling, um, and uh, my siblings did as well, my five siblings. Um, and I went to uh, Berkeley for undergrad. I was a English major because I like to write. And so I figured if, if you like to write, then you major in English. And uh, then I directly went to graduate school to Stanford University to get my master's in um, education. 
And um, from there, I taught at Balboa High School uh, for about four years. I was an English and ESL teacher in, in the San Francisco Unified School District. Um, and then I ended up working at the Early Academic Outreach Program at UC Berkeley for about three years, and then was recruited <clears throat> to work for the College Board, excuse me. <clears throat> and the College Board, you well know, uh, are the prayers of SAT, AP, et cetera. Two of the most uh, miserable years of my life. Um, and I say that because, you know, um, I didn't have any direct relationship or work with students. Um, I was just doing trainings and product promotion um, to tap the uh, Latino market, as I would say. And, and why I was hired there. So um, two years there, and then I decided I want to work with students. You know, um, I need to be around students, and um, I decided I'll take a fifty percent salary cut and uh, made my way to UT Austin, where I uh, was the director of a summer bridge program. I'm a huge fan of summer bridge programs. Uh, and then I had various roles there. They started a PhD program in cultural studies and curriculum and instruction. And I just uh, jumped on board um, with the sort of encouragement of some of my dear friends. And got my PhD while I was working full-time in the Dean of Students office. Um, right after that, I, rather than go into an academic career, which I never thought I would pursue, um, I took a job as the director of um, McNair Scholars at Beloit College in, in Wisconsin, a private liberal arts school, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And where I realized that perhaps the place where I was best suited to go in terms of a role was as a faculty member. So my first faculty gig was at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, um, another very tough two years for um, a variety of reasons on which I could probably write another book about. Let's just uh, suffice it to say, I have never encountered such uh, hostility and direct racism. Um, uh, and um, homophobia uh, from uh, the, uh, the community. Um, so I was there for two years and then I got my second academic job at Loyola University of Chicago. And I've been there for actually eight years, which is, a, as you can see from my history, a very, very long time. Um, and while I was at Loyola, um, you know, I've been a professor of curriculum and instruction and of higher education. And at the same time, um, I've also been a coach and a participant for the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. I'm, I'm also um, created a webinar on, on writing block um, for that community. And at the very tippy top, you'll see um, the landing page for my website. I've also run a side consulting and editing business for the past 10 years. And then what's not on here yet, because I haven't arrived there yet, is my, my next adventure, which is as the Director of Faculty Development and Career Advancement at George Mason University. So I will be in the DC uh, metro area and I'm really excited for, for that next role. So that's a little bit about me. I think it's important to know who you're gonna uh, hear from. So today, um, I'm really gonna focus on this idea of hyper-documentation, which is a term that um, I coined, and it means um, the effort to accrue awards, accolades, and eventually academic degrees to compensate for undocumented status. So the idea here is that, you know, I and others um, have really kind of had an obsessive relationship with the accrual of documents um, because partially, uh, you know, when you're undocumented, you're constantly collecting documents. You're constantly trying to make a case for your Americanness or for your 
uh, citizenship uh, or your legality. Um, and so uh, I'm going to take you through uh, one of my articles and then also just um, take questions um, as well. So uh, let's move into this. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, actually reading um, from my piece. And if you go to the chat, um, there should be a, uh, the article there. You can open it and, and download it. And um, I am on page 510, which is the third page in. And for those of you that are following along, I do wanna give you just a little bit of time to get there. Again, I'm on page 510. The article starts on page 508. So the last paragraph um, on 510. So before I read it, I'll um, just point you to the questions uh, on the slide. So the seeming necessity and yearning for this recognition begs the questions. Why, after gaining citizenship, do I continue to appeal for legitimacy, imagined or real? Has hyperdocumentation paid off for me personally and professionally and for my family? I argue that hyperdocumentation is one of the few ways to achieve a tangible, if not superficial, legitimacy as an undocumented immigrant within a national climate of fear and suspicion. However, I also question the worth and accompanying cost of hyperdocumentation and ask if it is perhaps an obsessive coping mechanism and potentially futile. Okay, and now I'm going to the, to the front page, page 508, <clears throat> the first um, paragraph that is not italicized. So, I clearly remember myself as a young brown Guatemalan girl going with my family on our routine trips to the Immigration and Naturalization Services Office, which is now known as the Office of Homeland Security. It was a ritual for the six of us to grab a number, sit on chain to the floor plastic chairs, stand in line for the next available window, and have a next, may I help you, government worker assist us. On the surface, it appeared as if we were part of a discreet and mundane series of tasks in the precise ritual of obtaining our sacrosanct green cards. Yet the thought of acquiring papeles or papers was anything but mundane. Acquiring papers was synonymous with achieving the American dream. In many ways, the process was religious. We followed the INS doctrine and performed processional rites, all culminating in a repentant return to, imagined, to an imagined place of social acceptance and redemption from illegal immigration. We hoped that after following certain commandments, such as passing the citizenship test, following federal immigration rules, and waiting, the pearly gates of the United States would open wide for us prodigal children. In preparation for our, IN, our INS visits, our parents would force us into our Sunday best thin white socks with lace trim and white patent leather Mary Janes for the girls and blue suits and shiny tight black shoes for the boys. And none of us was exempt from dippity do, the revered hair gel that came in a vat from the Mexican tienda 
and that was saved for special occasions such as these. The rigid seating, the special papers to fill out and read, the solemn entrance into the building through an officiated person, usually a security guard, the absolute understanding that we were to be on our most cordial behavior and the unspoken acknowledgement among all present that we worship the same God, American citizenship. These were our practices. The ceremonious actions were penance for the sins we committed for being illegal, as well as a show of reverence for the country we so long to become permanent citizens of. So here you see pictures of um, myself on the right and on the left, um, myself uh, in the middle and um, my older sister uh, Blanca and my little brother Andres and my mom. Um, and this uh, looks like it might be right before we left uh, Guatemala. Um, and as you can see, I was a very um, serious child, intense child. I'm still very intense, not as serious, but pretty serious. And, you know, um, the quote that you see here uh, by James Baldwin um, basically speaks to the fact that I used to think that being undocumented was something that made me feel alone. But then when I wrote about it and shared it um, aloud, I realized that as James Baldwin says, the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. So that thing that I was keeping sort of hidden, secret, and even at some points in my life felt shame about, I realized were the very things that connected me to others, the vulnerability of it. So let's go to page 514. Again, this is page 514 at the very top. Um, and in the article, I go through several, several rites of passage that I felt I went through as an undocumented student and person. And so I'm gonna share one of them with you. Then when I was in 10th grade in my ongoing quest to become the all-American girl and completely in line with my academically competitive nature, I applied to a prestigious leadership program called Girl State. Described as quote, a nonpartisan program that teaches young women responsible citizenship and love for God and country, end quote. Girl State accepted only the cream of the crop. And where I attended high school, the chosen girl held great prestige. The selection process consisted of a written application accompanied by a series of rigorous interview questions requiring all sorts of knowledge of social capital, what to wear during a face-to-face -face interview, how to present oneself during these specific interactions, the post-interview courtesies, and all the ways to exude a non-threatening yet confident, non-arrogant yet intelligent, non-masculine yet self-actualized, non-defiant yet curious, non-obnoxious yet witty, non-righteous yet principled demeanor. I had the privilege of acquiring some of these intangible skills throughout my academic schooling and socialization. At the end of the process, I received news that I had been chosen as the girl state representative from my school. My family and I celebrated over the weekend with tamales, frijoles negros, and platanos fritos. 
But this celebration proved premature. When the following Monday, my principal called me into his office to regretfully inform me that, that because I was a non-citizen, I did not qualify for participation in Girl State. I was denied the opportunity to exercise, quote, responsible citizenship and love for God and country, unquote, even though I had seemingly met all the requirements to effectively do so. My immigration status was the mortal sin that would not be forgiven. No matter the penance, be it a few more hours absorbing pages at the library, writing one more stellar essay, obtaining another certificate of merit or receiving another impeccable report card, my lack of real papeles or papers seemed to represent the ultimate evil. I dreamed of the moment when I could achieve academically or otherwise without the fear of having it all pulled out from under me. When would I be saved? So um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, right now if people uh, who are listening to this talk are resonate at all with this particular episode um, in my life. Um, and maybe in the chat, um, if, if you could share if you do or if you don't, or, or what kind of resonated with you, um, anything that surprised you, or just any of your um, thoughts in general, um, that would be uh, lovely. <clears throat> React using the Q&A feature, <laughs> says Kyle. So, um, so, so feel free to do that um, as we continue on. Um, but yeah, so, you know, the, the whole thing about this particular incident was it really represented this idea around citizenship. What is citizenship? What does it mean when, you know, you get in, in my case, when we were younger, we'd get an E for excellent as a grade um, for citizenship. And yet I was not an official legal uh, citizen per se. Um, so I think, you know, what this raises is this whole idea of, you know, cultural citizenship versus, you know, official um, federally sort of granted um, citizenship, who gets it, who doesn't, who deserves it, uh, quote unquote, because I, uh, my experience falls under the deserving immigrant um, narrative, which is this, you know, false narrative that basically says that, you know, unless you're absolutely perfect, um, perfect grades, perfect family, no criminal history, just, you know, super squeaky clean, um, then you don't even deserve to be considered um, a citizen here. Of course, I'm talking about racialized um, people, um, not all uh, uh, immigrants. So um, now I'm gonna um, read through one more uh, incident and I'm, I'm gonna go in between reading and, and talking about it. Um, but if you go to uh, the, the next page, which is uh, 515, um, in the middle of the page, um, where it starts 20 years later. So again, page 515, 515, um, the middle paragraph. Um, 20 years later and seemingly wiser, with a cadre of degrees from the University of California, Berkeley, Stanford, and UT Austin, I felt that these documents were significant moments in my academic trajectory. With each academic degree, I hope to have added yet another layer of protection against racism, sexism, xenophobia. So I thought that if I, and you know, I don't even know if I did this consciously, maybe partly consciously, partly subconsciously, that if I just got more degrees, 
that I would actually create sort of this bubble of protection from all of the systemic oppressions um, that we experience. And on completing my dissertation, I once again felt as if I had reached a certain life milestone. You know, uh, finishing a dissertation is a huge deal. A lot of work, a lot of persistence, a lot of jumping through hoops. As I walked across the stage to be hooded for my doctoral degree, I was literally fitted out in academic armor a gown of velvet and wool, an ornate cap, and a series of embellishments. I wondered what it would be like to don my regalia on a daily basis. Perhaps then my appearance, my appearance would accurately represent who I thought myself to be. I hearken back to this notion when I was recently, and this was written in 2010 or 11, so just 10 years ago or so, <clears throat> uh, I was asked to participate as an immigration expert in a campus-wide diversity effort. But in reality, this latest rite of passage demonstrated otherwise. So you all are all familiar with campus-wide diversity efforts. Um, and sometimes they have nothing to do with embracing diversity at all, even if that's the intent. Um, sometimes the impact many times can be harmful. So 120 people were packed together into an auditorium at Valley View Tech College. This is a pseudonym uh, located in a small Midwest town that was once the headquarters of the KKK. The audience was gathered for America Unites on Immigration, a panel discussion and one of the many events during the school's diversity week, an attempt to bring awareness to and encourage dialogue on issues not commonly spoken about in public settings. I was one of four panelists invited to share my knowledge about and experiences with immigration. I decided to tell my counter story as a once undocumented immigrant. Nothing could have prepared me for what followed. Brad Johnson, another pseudonym, the event moderator had given me a mild warning prior to the event in his email reminder. He said that he suspected that conversations will eventually lead to the subject of undocumented immigration in the US today. And he goes on to say that this will be a great opportunity for the panel to address many issues from legality and ethics to economics. Helping the audience see modern immigration in an historical context is also one of my desired outcomes of the evening. Most importantly, while there may be emotions in the room that evening, I'll say, we have the opportunity to model civil discourse. That was the red alert. And show that people can listen to each other and learn something in the process. So this was the preview um, for me to give my talk. Um, and you know, talk about my immigration experience. Now, before the panel began, I engaged in my normal routine. Um, and you all will be familiar with this if you spent any time in higher ed and gone to um, social events or um, academic events. I went from table to table to introduce myself and, and make small talk. Um, this isn't something I enjoyed. I've never enjoyed doing that. I'm, I'm more of an introvert, actually, a forced extrovert, um, because in academia, I think, you know, um, to present um, and the, some of the things that academia values are about being without, you know, for lack of a better word, the loudest person uh, in the room. 
uh, figuratively um, and sometimes literally. Um, so even though I didn't enjoy it, it was a skill my professional academic and home training had fostered within me. The goal of the exercise was always to take the temperature of the audience, right? Um, and in situations where I was visibly the other, this was the case here, brown, female, highly educated, it allowed me to present myself in a less threatening fashion. You know, I wanted them to know, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, I have a family, you know, this whole thing. Um, the weather's cold outside, what do you do here? Are you a native of Wisconsin? I have a family waiting at home, all these things. Um, so I made some strategic choices. When I looked out into the audience, I uh, went toward the lone Asian woman, visibly Asian anyway, one of the three African-Americans in the audience, the older white man in military garb, and all of those in suits um, who I presume to be administrators of the college, and a handful of middle-aged white folks who made up about 85% of the audience, as far as I could see. My strategy um, involved a careful balance of making those who might feel uncomfortable more at ease and identifying potential allies of color in a sea of white. Of course, these choices were in no way fail-proof. And in fact, they were completely based on my own stereotypes. However, it was a strategy that seemed to have worked well for me in the past. And it made me just feel more in control of my audience, like I wasn't going in cold. So um, I was on a panel and um, my fellow panelists included a white female professor of history, a Filipina professor of anthropology, and a white male professor of economics. And so Brad, remember, he's the moderator that sent me the email. He introduced me and he focused on my credentials, highlighting my academic pedigree and a long list of accomplishments and setting what I thought was you know, an appropriate tone. But as the evening progressed, I noticed an obvious pattern. Audience members addressed the two white professors as <clears throat> Dr. So-and-so and never addressed my Filipina colleague or me using our titles. In fact, not once were we even addressed by our names. Audience members simply pointed at us or referred to the color of our apparel. The one with the blue shirt, the, the one with the scarf. And then the common critique from the audience after we gave our talks was that my fellow Filipina colleague of color and I uh, were very, quote, emotional. Um, bleeding liberals, I think was used a couple of times. Uh, and that we gave accounts that were devoid of facts. While our white counterparts were seen as factual, data-based, objective. Interestingly, all of us on the panel agreed that we provided equal amounts of statistical information, historical references, and present day examples, yet our information was colored by race and, and gender. And then if you move to the next page, 517, I'm gonna skip those two first paragraphs and um, start with, it, with every word. So with every word I uttered that evening, and um, if you can imagine, I'm in a panel of four, there's about 120 people there. I'm already, I don't know if you've ever been in a room where you know you are unwelcome, but it is the most petrifying experience. Um, I, every time I said something, I felt the level of danger increase. And I'm not exaggerating here. I literally felt the blood rush out of my face and the little hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. And even now, as I talk about this, I, I, I feel in my body what I felt at the moment. As I spoke, a large white man of about 300 uh, pounds and 50 years 
repeatedly attempted to rise from his chair and made arm gestures that indicated he wanted to refute my story. So picture this, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking, giving my story. In the middle of it, this man kind of pops out of his chair and is, is just livid. The moderator did his best to discreetly keep him in his chair. The moderator is literally pushing the, down the shoulders of this guy and I'm still trying to talk. I was further distracted by a 30 something white man who crossed his arms, huffed and fidgeted throughout my presentation. Very obvious. Um, when I suggested to the audience that I, as an undocumented immigrant, probably possessed more knowledge about US history than any person in that room, he stood up, audibly scooted his chair underneath the table and stomped out. My facultad or my sixth sense kicked in. I was caught between survival mode, an instant to flee and resistance mode, an urge to say more. Obviously I followed the second urge. My talk, believe it or not, only lasted five minutes, even though it felt like five hours, but each second seemed to trigger a volatile emotion within the audience. You know, I could see people's facial expressions. I'm a master of reading facial expressions. I'm also a horrible uh, poker face. So, um, and I'm an energy reader as well. So all of these things were just, um, it was very hostile. I knew I would finish but I was unsure of my emotional and mental condition on leaving the event. When it did finally end, my Filipina colleague and I rushed out to my car, shaken, but not surprised, and quickly locked our doors. I wondered how often had I experienced something similar to this and how much more I could bear. No document could have shielded me. So later that week, I received an email message from the event organizer. And uh, this, was, this was what he said. <clears throat> I just wanted to take a moment to send a personal note to express my gratitude for your participation on the panel Tuesday. I have spoken to several instructors here and they all reported that many students were charged from the event. I found that an interesting choice of words, charged. Many reported that their students continued the conversation into the next day. Two instructors also told me that they had also learned several new things on the subject. Also, thank you for sharing your personal story. You being there and claiming your history gave everyone a face to relate to a story, preventing them from detaching from the human component present in every story of immigration. I'm looking forward to attending the event on the Dream Act next Friday. Susan, my wife and I are registered and will be attending. I also may be bringing some of my students as well. Again, Thank you for all that you did to make the event on Tuesday a success. So I understood that my contribution to the panel was valuable, but at what expense? At what expense? Um, you know, I felt that the fact that I was asked to tell my story for the benefit of others was a double-edged sword, right? Um, the telling of my story was freeing. Um, you know, it, it's always empowering to share my story, but at the same time, it was exploitive because the space was not safe, to say the least. And I don't blame Brad Johnson for this. You know, his his emails were so sincere and a just a, a, a wonderful person. Having said that though, I couldn't sleep 
that night and had a series of anxiety attacks in the days that followed, which um, involved emergency room visits and which also involved at that time, me hiding the fact that those things were happening because I you know, was trying to put up a, a tough front. It took me weeks to stop the daily recounting to friends, family, colleagues, and students about the traumatic side effects of having my life on display and up for discussion. So I was asking myself, was this worth it? Will I do it again? Certainly hiding out and staying silent would appear safer than revealing my story. And yet it's precisely my willingness to be vulnerable that garners strength within me. As it turns out, my refuge from danger no longer lies in concealing, but rather in revealing my narrative. So, it's a bittersweet ending, right? Because as you can imagine, I've done this time and time again over the past 10 years, some under a wonderfully um, warm environments like this one. Others, for example, I went to Purdue University and uh, received a very hostile reception. Um, uh, I guess kind of unexpectedly, but I've been in different places where, you know, I've traveled somewhere alone and, and then had people who have been just incredibly hostile. Um, has documentation deluded me into thinking that I have somehow escaped the mundane when actually I've positioned myself and been positioned to till the fields of academia without appropriate compensation, respite, or acknowledgement, right? Because that's the other thing, is that when you write about yourself or your people even, it's not seen as objective work in the academy. It's seen as biased, unrigorous, me search. The position, this positioning poignantly parallels my path to citizenship when I fought hard to repay my debt of illegality with the hope and expectation that I could breathe, breathe more easily and gain acceptance as an American. In the effort to challenge my position as an undocumented immigrant, I in fact comply, I'm complicit with the very ideas that are arguably the source of discriminatory teachings, practices, and institutions. I contradict myself. I hoard documents so as to hide my undocumented status, and in the process, highlight the significance of documentation itself. Through hyper-documentation, I employ my facultad to confront the rage and intolerance of American common sense beliefs about immigration. So um, that is one of the stories. <laughs> But I could, you know, I could tell a lot more. I'm sure you have stories to tell and incidents that you've been a part of. But I think this particular incident is so poignant um, because it just uh, uh, there's so much to talk about in terms of um, the intersections of academia, the production of knowledge, um, respectability politics, the um, I'm not sure what to call it, but sort of the mythology around Americanness and American dream. Um, I think about Bettina Love's a concept of freedom dreaming. And, you know, I wonder if I would have done this differently a second time around. So uh, I'm on the last page here, page 520, uh, the only remaining paragraph here. I thought documentation would protect me from American common sense notions of illegal immigration status. Yet, as my facultad has strengthened and become increasingly precise, I've gained a particularly strong understanding that security and self-preservation are not as straightforward 
as the necessary paperwork. Survival and success require much more than acquiring text on paper. When attempting to prove my American worthiness, I now know that there is a certain nuance to reading others that requires a specifically tailored response to each situation and context. An intangible immediate sensing resulting from a refined mastery of facultad. At some times, interactions call for the slightest mention of a prestigious degree. At others, a subtle reference to a scholarly source or a humorous account of a tale involving a certain level of literally proficiency. Such responses are not planned, rather they're unconscious mediators between the lingering urgency to compensate for my lack of documentation and the obsessive need to hyperdocument. In my attempt to both relieve the anxiety and satisfy the compulsion of never being a truly legitimate American, I tell myself that my arsenal of documents is complete. My case for worthiness is valid and the paper trail exhaustive. That is, until the next time my merit is challenged. So uh, to end, uh, I just want to, you know, I, I can't do a presentation without bringing up my mom. So this is uh, my cute mom uh, holding my, my very first book. And, you know, I have so much gratitude uh, because, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, if my mom, if my mama had, you know, just a sliver of the uh, capital and opportunity that I've had, she would have written 10 to 15 books by now. She would have been, you know, the, I don't know, the president. She, you know, everything that I get to do is because of the sacrifices that my uh, parents and specifically my mom um, has made. You know, she was an undocumented immigrant mother of six uh, in California um, without a college education. And now she's the CEO of a charter school called Richmond College Prep, um, where we grew up. 50% uh, brown students, 50% black students. And she, um, you know, that school has been named like the number one school in Contra Costa County. Um, it's an incredible school that she's run for about 15 years now. So um, she has her uh, own tale to tell, but I just want to uh, take the opportunity to, to honor her. Um, if you'd like more information about my work, um, my editing, um, who I am in general, um, you can visit my website. So thank you very much. And now I will open it to questions or discussion. Thank you so much. That was so fantastic. Oh. So we are going to do things a little differently than what we normally do here at the Litton Center. So for those, we have lots of uh, returning guests. Um, we've opened up the chat entirely starting now. So folks can um, use the chat to, to contribute questions, ideas, reactions, and thoughts as we have a discussion. Um, and we're going to give an opportunity for folks to join the panel um, if they would like to have a more of a face-to-face -face conversation. There's no pressure, um, but it's wonderful here. It's so it's warm and inviting. <laughs> um, if they'd like to share some of the reactions and thoughts. And um, I'm going to start with a question to kind of get us going, and then we're going to go to some of the reactions that we've already received. Um, so I want to I want to talk about. There's a point actually in your timeline where I intersected with your timeline um, many moons ago, <laughs> a long, not that long ago as we were both timeless. I will not age either of us when I was at the very, very beginning. I was just a, um, still a student and at the very beginning of my career and got to learn from you um, I'm working for you at EAOP many <laughs> long ago. I'm just like, kind of like, it was a big formative experience for me. And working there with the pre-college academy that EOP ran, working with high school students. And there's something that struck me as you were talking about your experience as 
um, a high school student, like this kind of coming, trying to kind of engage with identity at that kind of critical moment, that stage of sort of secondary socialization. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of our students are coming out of as they come into Ohlone for the first time, right? They're they're trying to find, they're, they kind of went through this process of maybe wrestling with or engaging with their authentic selves. And they're looking for more of, more of that, of who they are and exploring who they are. So my question is, is sort of twofold. One is what advice do you have to those students who are coming in? And then maybe just as importantly, what advice do you have to our institution about how to best support students to engage in that exploration? Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Um, yeah, so I think for, for students, um, what I would say is that your experience, and what I mean by that is just everything about you growing up, everything that you're going through right now, is official knowledge. So what I mean by that is like, can you, for, can you think of reframing how you live your life as not casual, not accidental, but actually as, I don't know, the destiny in some ways, right? And that what you have is super valuable and you don't need other people to affirm that to make it so. Um, so, you know, for example, when I was an undergrad at Berkeley that first year, I mean, I was just, uh, you know, I had been a straight A student in Richmond, California, but that didn't compare to the straight A student from, you know, whatever day school um, on the East Coast. And so I did miserably my first year um, at Berkeley. And I even had a professor who, you know, accused me of plagiarism because he didn't, uh, she didn't believe that I had written an essay. And so um, what I'm saying is there's ways that those, don't let anything kill your spirit, you know? I, I you know, I could have easily, well, thank God I wasn't expelled for, you know, that false um, accusation, but, I did feel at that point, like, what the hell am I doing here? Is this what it's gonna be like? This is my freshman year. And instead, um, you know, not alone, because I sought out resources at Berkeley, I went to the learning center. So whatever resources you have on campus at Ohlone, it's not for others, it's for you. So make sure that you take advantage um, of those. And, you know, I say, you know, like my, the last talk I gave here, turn your mess into your message. You know, um, it's such a, um, you know, it, it's such an empowering way to live, right? That when you, when you uh, face adversity, you're not like, it's over. You're like, it's beginning. This is beginning, you know, this is, this is my call to the fire. So, so that's what I would say to students. To institutions, I would say that um, do a, a self-assessment or an institutional assessment, self-assessment of whether or not you are an undocu-friendly institution. How do you show that? One, your website, you know, uh, in the landing page, do undocumented students see themselves? Or do they have to search under layers of pages? That sends a message, right? Um, do you have a center for undocumented students? Do you talk about undocumented students? Um, you know, do you have opportunities for undocumented students? Um, so being very explicit about your welcoming of students and providing uh, resources. So, um, that's what I would say. I muted myself. I was like, ah, and had to do the, the Zoom race to unmute. Um, that I that's really insightful. And actually, I have taken a note for the institutional piece. I've taken a note to bring back um, to engage in the discussion. We have really um, we're really growing. We have some really great people, actually, um, a whole bunch of folks who are here um, for this talk who are doing really great transformative work with our undocumented student population um, and have been. Um, and and there's, there is definitely room to continue um, growing um, in that direction. Um, 
I also I have to say, um, I full disclosure since we're on recording, I looked up to you so much. I don't know how much you knew that because I was so green, <laughs> like I was so, and I was going through my own exploration, my own identity at the time. But um, so if people are wondering if is is Dr. Chang like she seems like such an incredible mentor and so so strong and powerful and so. Um, incredible. Yes. <laughs> like, absolutely. Um, it was a, it was a big, it was like, you were, you may not have realized that you had such an impact on me in that, in that brief moment that summer, but it was, you're really, um, really so happy to have you here. Um, Catherine's gonna, um, <laughs> so, oh, um, Catherine's gonna yeah. <laughs> um, continue on with um, some of the reactions that we've received um, already. And we have some stuff coming into the chat as well. So to your earlier question, Dr. Chang, you had asked whether your story was resonating. And we did have two different um, people respond to that. And one of them has told me that she's willing to become a panelist. So I'm going to promote her in just a second. But um, the first, I just want to read to you. And uh, this is from Frida Calvo Huerta. And if, if you want to add anything, Frida, or be, join as a panelist, please just put it in the chat and we're happy to do that. But for now, I'll just read it. So the comment says, it definitely resonates. Ever since arriving in the US at nine, I've pushed myself to excel academically to compensate for the lack of legal papers. I resonate with receiving academic recognition, but it always feels like it falls short. I feel like I'm not doing enough and it feels like ultimately this country does not want me. So before I promote Gata, I just wanted to give you the chance to react to that, Dr. Harcheng. I thank you for uh, putting that out there, and um, it, it uh, you know it just resonates with me so much. Even now that I you know I became a citizen during the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, um, but even now with a PhD and documents and stuff, I. It, 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 that that feeling lingers, right? That you're unwanted, um, and so it just uh, resonates. Also, this idea of falling short definitely um, relate. Thank you. And then we have. I'm adding. Gada Al Masri, who is um, the Dean of Social Sciences. I'm adding her because she had several comments and questions mm -hmm. that I think would be easier to let her ask, ask herself. And it's not letting me start my I, video. Dr. Al Masri, AKA my Dean, Gada. Um, I just, I just um, promoted you co-host, so you should be able to start your video now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm actually a little nervous, <laughs> totally unplanned. Um, I wanted to just to say, Dr. Chang, I, as soon as you started speaking, um, and I wrote this, but I'm going to read it really quickly. I somehow um, am soothed by your approach to humanizing the undocumented experiences in the United in U.S. education. And uh, I say this because. Um, I was an undocumented student as well um, at the age of four. Um, this so deeply resonates with me at a core primal level um, in the struggle to be legitimate, a legitimate human being, actually. Um, like the citizenship piece goes beyond that. It's about being human. Mm -hmm. um, I continue to struggle with legitimacy despite my PhD. Um, and despite becoming a naturalized citizen of the, the US, also from 1986 um, Immigration Act, um, the layers of invisibility and lack of human worth are voices that continue to echo in my life and in my consciousness um, on a regular basis. And it's never enough. I feel like it's never enough. Like I'm never enough no matter what I do and no matter how many papers I have. It, it still doesn't matter. I'm not the right type of human being. Um, and so that's been like my experience. Um, and so just hearing you, um, 
I got a little shaky because it 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 touches at such a core place, um, and it touches my own childhood um, in a way that um, very few things or experiences I've had connect me with that. And I feel like I'm running away from my childhood mm. to run um, to run away so that I can be invisible in a sense, but yet at the same time, I'm struggling between invisibility and legitimacy. So there's a lot of struggles there. And then these are also cross cut with racial um, aspects and other forms of identity in the United States and our obsession around it. Um, I have a question for you, if I may. Um, in the stories you share, it also seems that the intersections of multiple identities from undocumented, racial, educated, gendered, all of those different layers are competing for legitimacy within the larger US narratives around race, gender, sexuality, et cetera. I find that there is a competition for whose community has the worst and most horrific experiences of oppression um, and by extension is most deserving of belonging in the US. What suggestions do you have for how we attempt to enact visibility for marginalized communities without the sense of competition for space and voice in the broader narrative. And then also um, without what you shared, the experience of, of the exploitation, right? So by bringing it to the forefront, you're also, it's being used basically it's on our backs, right? You're being used to enhance and enrich others. So there's just, a, there's really tension there. And I, I have not been able to find a space where I can sit with that um, in my own um, strength. Uh, thank you so much, uh, I Yeah, fully resonates uh, with me. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of Ansar Dua's uh, notion of tolerance of ambiguity. Um, and I think that that is increasingly, as I get older, it becomes the mantra of my life is to, the more tolerant I am of ambiguity, of not knowing, of messiness, of intersectionality, the more alive and compassionate that I become. Um, I think uh, to address the intersectionality question, you know, like for me, you know, I'm multiracial, I identify as queer, I, you know, um, was undocumented. I'm also hearing impaired, you know, I wear hearing aids. So, you know, I think all of those things in some ways are gifts that allow me to connect um, with others. But, um, you know, I, I, you know, my question to you is, um, have you written about this? I love your question. There's been a book inside of me about this that I um, am not fully ready to share. That's it, it is something that's there and maybe this is the time to do it because the idea of putting this into a book has been a, on my mind for a while. Um, but as an academician, I'm used to putting it in terms of theory, which is a distancing, right. intellectual and emotional distancing. But I think the narrative I need to speak to is is the very deeply personal connected to the political. Um, yeah. So I, now I'm thinking of Mora, Sherry Morada's theory on the flesh. And perhaps you can use theory to bridge that distance between your childhood and your now academic self. Um, I think, I don't believe in coincidences. So I think we are talking to one another because you're meant to write that book. And so I would say to you that um, you sort of put yourself in this situation. Now you can't back out. Um, but, you know, I, I, all of my writing is personal. And uh, yeah, you know, um, because it, it should be, and and it 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 does cross over to the theoretical and academic. Um, but it's you know by writing a book like that, that is a. It's like an affront. 
uh, a pedagogical affront um, to this distancing that you're talking about. Um, and, you know, I found like when I wrote this book about being undocumented and then this next book that's coming out about being multiracial, you know, um, it's so scary and it's so, um, you know, I had to get permission from some of my family members to write about some of the things that I wrote, you know. Um, but I think my sense is we need to trust our, that primal instinct, you know, um, and not let anything or anyone or any institution um, infringe um, upon that. Um, yeah. So I, I know you, you I, and part of why I asked you that too is because some of the questions you ask are so important and large that there should be a book dedicated to them. You know, I, I couldn't, I could not give answers to those questions any justice. Um, oh gosh, okay. You know, through this medium. So yeah, well, and there's you. folks to support you on that uh, journey, I being one of them. I've got my teammates here too, I know. I, I, it's been seven years since I've actually, since I went into administration and left the field. So there's also this other fear of going back to it after being away for so long, but I, I can learn, I can study again. Yeah, but and you know, I'm about to take an administrative position um, in faculty development, but I, you know, we can use our experiences to, you know, build on uh, other very creative um, topics of writing, you know, that will never go away. And going back to it, I mean, rather than thinking about it going back to it, maybe you can think about it as an evolution, you know, mm -hmm. of, of you as a writer. Now, all the experiences you've had as an administrator, mm -hmm. how those sure. have informed your work as well. I want to, first of all, thank you. And I, I don't think this was an accident either because I was running, I happened to have a meeting and I was able to get out of it in time to join you. And as soon as you started talking, I'm writing <laughs> as it's, a, it's, it's moving, your words are moving through me and it's stimulating. I've got several paragraphs here already. Um, but what I love that you mentioned, and I think that maybe that's where the point is, this notion of ambiguity especially like around transgender, LGBTQ, like why is it that we need to locate? And, and I always thought this was always a problem with language. As soon as you name it, mm -hmm. actually anchor it and no longer allow it to be and to flourish. And this happens in academia, right? Because you get disciplined. These are disciplined. Exactly. Disciplined, it gets anchored in a very singular canon of understanding and theory that when you're trying to do interdisciplinary work, just like being intersectional, right? It gets played out on our bodies and through our bodies in these ways that academia itself, you know, here we are experts in these things. It situates you in such a way that it becomes disciplined and no longer nurtures the margins where the creativity, the innovation, and I really feel like the transformation, social transformations can occur at those sites, but. Yes, and now you're bringing to mind um, Chela Sandoval's methodology of the oppressed, um, where she talks about exactly that uh, in a very, uh, her writing is deep and sometimes, you know, takes about 20 reads, but um, very important work. I think, you, and I really feel like you're moving toward a theory here around just this whole fluidity part and this anchoring and this disciplining. I think this is really great stuff. Dr. Michael, did you, or Dr. Lee, did you want uh, me to step aside? I feel badly because I know we have students and folks and this is really for them and I want them to be able to engage. <laughs> It's, it's, I have to say, I was just going to comment that it's, a, this conversation is just so wonderful because it's, you know, one, two people that I respect and adore having this, like, and then also now I get to check in with you about your progresses in your writing. 
<laughs> so so you now have two people who are going to be watching at least actually a few people in the chat in the, in the room as well i think it's really i think it's a really powerful conversation um we want to definitely open the door to other folks who want to contribute and um ask questions we do have something uh comment in the chat um from frida um which i'm going to read um this talk really strikes deep as you read your paper and shared your experiences in academia, I felt understood and moved to tears. Even having the word hyper documentation to describe this trauma that propels us to seek papers to compensate is very meaningful. Thank you. As a current Berkeley undergrad, your experiences feel like looking at a mirror in the future. Well, beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, I would say for you that um, I think that. Um, my best thinking and writing uh, start as tears. I mean, that's, you know, uh, I guess that is the river that uh, our words flow through. Um, but, you know, I feel like in academia, we're so, you know, separated from our bodies and um, it's important you know, when, when you cry, when you, when you um, feel these intense emotions, that is a place of truth. That is a place of truth. Uh, your body's reacting to that. And so I think that's where, you know, the fact that you had a strong response today, you know, that, that is very significant. Um, it's like your body's speaking to you. Um, uh, there's this great, oh, I can't remember her name, but it's um, it's called something like Chicana Vergüenza, uh, speaking to tell your secrets or something like that. I mean, is it Cindy? I, I don't remember. But anyways, I'm just thinking about how, you know, some of the work that we can do can be around that speaking of whether they're secrets or speaking of um, our experiences, but they come from a central place of emotion that is so undervalued and even punished um, in the academy, um, especially um, as people who, you know, identify as women. And um, so I, I would really listen to that. I think, you know, every time uh, in either in a class or a talk or whatever, when someone cries and apologizes, I'm like, you know, don't apologize for your tears. That place is a sacred place that you need to protect and, and listen to. Um, so, but I, I really appreciate um, that uh, response that you had. And I think I'm glad that you feel um, understood. Uh, that's, the, that's the one thing we all have in common is that we all wanna feel understood. This is really resonating with me. I feel like there are two pieces that I wanna kind of pull out and um, reflect on more. One is the fact of how expressing emotion seems so antithetical in most anti this sort of antiseptic nature of academic spaces where it's like you're supposed to be like you're detached from your humanity <laughs> and in the humanities that can be really a bunch um that can be really hard <laughs> um but um you're detached and you're you're expressing emotion is punished and it kind of it it tends to it tends to elevate and celebrate a kind of, I think, a racialized white normative, like this sort of like stay within the lines, but also a very gendered space too, where the assumption is femininity or something along that kind of spectrum is associated with emotionality or emotional response. Um, and thus is diminished in, in as something that is valid in uh, a patriarchal system. And I think higher ed is just, rife with with that mm -hmm. um so there's a there's a lot to unpack there but the the other thread um um that i i keep sort of thinking about i was thinking about this during your talk too is how do we create spaces not only to combat that for our students and with our students by our sides but also how do we create spaces for our students to tell stories as part of this academic world and validate that storytelling. Um, I, it comes up, it's, I, this is something I've been thinking about a lot and um, 
uh, thinking about the different roles that we play within an institution like like Ohlone, where you know we're we're wearing different kinds of hats, is that we want to know, we desperately want to know what our student experiences are, but we create an environment where it's almost impossible for them to tell their stories. Mm. With, you know, like where everything else is valued <laughs> except for what your actual experience was if you're a student. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, so many thoughts, Kyle. Um, I have a suggestion for a couple of pedagogical like tools to use. Yeah. Um, two very specific things that I have my students do is, um, for example, I'm teaching a class on uh, curriculum and pedagogy in higher education. However, this could be done in any course because every course has curriculum and pedagogy in it. And what I ask students to do is I ask them to come up with a 10 minute presentation on their curricular autobiography. Um, five slides, all images, no text. And curriculum, we talk about what curriculum is, what curriculum isn't, um, and you know, outside of the classroom context, who taught you? What did you learn? What have been the spaces where you have felt heard and seen? And what I do is at the end of every class is I have three of them give their presentation. So we do it throughout the entire semester. And that, you know, I had one, one day where I was like, um, I don't remember what context was, what I was like, I'm gonna, we can end class early or and like, no, we wanna hear the curricular autobiographies because they're listening to each other and that's where learning takes place. Yeah. I could certainly lecture about difference. I don't think it'll have the same impact as students telling their stories. Right. The other thing I do is, um, and you might have some version of this is, Sandra Cisneros has a vignette in How on Mango Street called My Name, where she talks about her name. Yeah. And so I have students at the beginning of, of the semester emulate her writing you know, like try, try to be Sandra Cisneros in, in the style yeah. and tell me about your name. And that's how we learn about um, each other, but it also sets a tone, you know, like A, pronounce my name correctly, you know, B, my history, my ancestry is important, you know, um, C, there's a lot of people that, that when I give this, I might say, oh, there's nothing to my name. Yeah. And I'm like, pick a week. Right. Ask some questions. Ask your parents. You know, or ask anyone, you know, of your elders. See, see what happens. And all of them have a story about their name. Some are funny, some are yeah. tragic, some are, but you get a piece of everyone. And so I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think as much as we can authentically incorporate students' voices into the curriculum. Yeah. You know, it's like that saying, right? Um, students um, won't respond to you unless they know that you care. Yeah. You could be the best lecturer, you can be the best researcher, but if, if you don't show humanity, um, in your class and you're not gonna get humanity back. Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's so many things we can do. The problem is it requires that academics and professors release control. And I think academics have a lot of problems with that. Yeah. Say, like, you know, I'm not the expert. Yes, the, the first thing I say a lot of times with, with students in, my courses as we're getting started and like as I'm trying to set up my my positionality with the rest of the classes the most powerful thing you can say in this class is I do not know mm -hmm. as the beginning of knowledge not the end and so but that's a kind of vulnerability that I think a lot of academics struggle with because that especially I think for some academics who feel like who actually have connected themselves and their identity with those papers in a way that it's the thing that they hold on to. And so, um, and so I think but there's a, there's an emotional vulnerability. It's not just releasing control of the class. It's also in order to emphasize that relational, I feel like is 
is releasing some of the the authority, not the necessarily the academic authority, but the the situational authority of the space too, and being vulnerable and sitting in the circle, being in the space in the same place as students. Um, and it's it's a really powerful thing, but it's going to be if you're trained to be to you know in this very hierarchical model, it can be a really challenging thing. But this is. Um, this is how we learn from our students. This is how we understand how to actually provide service to serve them and mm -hmm. to grow. Um, um, so yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm coming coming to a space personally where I feel much more confident saying I don't know things um, at this point in my life, <laughs> um, whereas I was afraid to. And I think as a first generation college student, you know, right. I was supposed to not say that because I didn't want people to know that I didn't know. And okay. now I'm like, I say it all the time. <laughs> so um, and if you're a student of mine on this uh, chat, you probably know that. Um, we are going to begin to wrap up. Um, uh, I want to um, first thank you, Dr. Cheng, for um, coming and sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your story um, with us and your incredible work. Um, you are um, a favorite here uh, at the Lytton Center in Ohlone, um, and um, I really can't wait to see how a lot of these ideas um, uh, blossom and grow um, uh, here at Ohlone and, and into our community. I want to share with um, everyone here that at 3 p.m. we're having a safe spaces conversation and open dialogue about the Ukraine, um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, if you're interested in joining, it's um, uh, being hosted by our um, Step Up Ohlone um, uh, Student Health Services, um, as well as um, a number of faculty from the Social Sciences Division, um, including several, including Dr. Michael, um, who bring expertise um, uh, in what's taking place there and is really going to be a place where people can process and think about their reaction and response as a safe place to just receive care. Um, and so I want to encourage folks to join us um, at 3 p.m. And again, thank you so much for a really incredible afternoon. Um, appreciate you so much and really looking forward to seeing how all of this excellent work um, continues on. Thank you all so much. Take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you so 